Привет! I am the High Apostate, and welcome to the playground. Today we are going to Russia to the fall of the monarchy, but first, some housekeeping. Uh, I, I kind of want to explain why this isn't an Easter episode. Very simply, I couldn't decide how to approach it. There's the it's a pagan holiday angle, there's the it's a stupid bunny chicken festival angle, and then there's the it's the weekend we all collectively made someone get tortured to death because of how evil and morally bankrupt we were before we were alive, because that's just how much we suck as people deep down in our essences angle. And that's a thing I'm working through in therapy right now, and I'm not sure that I have the mental real estate for an episode on it. So after doing a Halloween episode and a Christmas episode, that's why I'm taking Easter off. Also, I am working on a website. I'm holding a steady pace for myself to get everything transferred over, and when it's done, the website will launch publicly. So there will be another thing that I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but it will hold episodes, it'll have show notes, it'll have a little summary of the episode, blog posts. And there is also going to be some stuff there dealing with my hiking pictures and me trying to learn nature photography through Ko-Fi donations. So if that's something you might be interested in looking at, I like having eyes on my pictures. And that's all the boring shit, so let's get it did. And it's time to start answering the question, was Ra Ra Rasputin lover of the Russian queen? And to do that, this episode isn't only about Rasputin. It's also about a quote I found from a 1917 article titled Antecedents of the Russian Revolution that was published in the American Political Science Review that is really just a kind of boring political science review of how a small group of people close to power can destroy a country, and it's definitely not anything that's relevant, you know, a hundred years later. The quote in question is attributed to the monk Tliador. He said, Rasputin is dead, but Rasputinsvo are still alive. And that gave me kind of a sexy tingle down my spine when I read that. Rasputin, a man who is reputed to be so evil, and so powerful, and so mad, that they had to kill him three times like a one-man evil trinity had a Rasputinsvo, and they were still going? Kind of sent my heart into a flutter. My personal relationship with Rasputin began when I was a kid. I love movie villains, and not the new kind that make them likable kind of movie villain, but the evil bad guys. It's more fun for me to figure out what makes them likable, figure out what their motivations are, figure out what their wants are, aside from just, I want power, I want the princess dead. And I like figuring out what they have going on that makes them the way they are. And I loved the movie Anastasia. And my favorite character in that was, unsurprisingly from what I just said, Rasputin. He was evil and he was awful, but he made it look cool, and it probably did a lot to feed into my believing in literal Satan magic wizard power phase I had in life before I realized that that has the same sort of issues as just boring garden variety Christianity. And why even convert to a different kind of Christianity when Christianity isn't true? Eh, it's not all Satanism, and it's not even all Satanism I played with in my life, but it's what I had going on then. And Rasputin also probably had something to do with my desire to have a wicked sweet beard game, which I'm still working on that. I have a big beard game. That's what I have. But it's because of Anastasia, I've always had a kind of low-key fascination with Rasputin. And because of my life, I've had a low-key fascination with mystics of all kinds. My books I want to read list is a mixture of atheism, STEM, philosophy, religion, conspiracy theories, esotericism. And a lot of my interests came together when I read that after the Russian Revolution, after the death of Rasputin, the Rasputinsvo were alive. What were the Rasputinsvo, though? I didn't know, but presumably Nicholas Goldweiser, who wrote the article I learned about this from and who has a name like he founded Budweiser's Wheat Beer Division, did. And he included a helpful note. Rasputinsvo is the spirit and methods of Rasputin. Oh, shit. Could I learn Rasputin's methods? It's not going to give me literal magic powers, of course, but it, it kind of woke up my inner child. I was fascinated by his talking detached head and green fire, and my teenage pseudo-mystical self wanting literal magical powers and saying stupid shit like, well, the Heisenberg uncertainty slit experiment shows that we can affect the quantum dipshittery. And it kind of got grown at me going a little bit, too, the one who likes to have that knowledge rattling around in his brain to sift through when needed. This whole Rasputin-Clisty thing is going to be a long-term investigation and something that I'll come back to. 
This episode is going to start with kind of a shallow dive into the Mad Monk, and then an intro crash course into the Clisty. His story has been told a lot, I couldn't find anything super new about it, so maybe not as deep as I would have liked, but we're kind of here for other stuff anyway, right? We're here for the weird cult fuck stuff. Before that, there was an illiterate Siberian peasant named Grigory Yefimovich Novik. Tangentially, it seems like Siberia is a major source of interesting Russians. That Vissarion did his cult stuff there, Rasputin was from there, and if they're not interesting enough, we seem to just send them there, like Dostoevsky. Grigory would get the last name change to Rasputin later, because it means debauched one, and that's the kind of thing that happens when you, uh, spoilers, when you tell people you have a magic healing penis. Growing up, there was definitely some weird shit going on, but part of that is relevant foreshadowing. Apparently, he could heal horses. Which is neat if true. It wasn't true, but if it was, it would be neat. Uh, when he was 19, he got married and had some kids. As far as I know, he has living offspring, but I'm not sure it's something that you would want advertised, and I'm not here for them, so I didn't look too hard. After some time generally resputing about, he left his wife, or alternatively, after fucking so many people the townsfolk told him he had to leave, he became a wandering holy man in the Mediterranean, with a quick stop by the St. Nicholas Monastery in Verkoturia in the Ural Mountains to become a monk, until he had a vision of the Virgin Mary telling him to go advise and assist the royal family. You know, like you do. And a moment about his time at the monastery, it seems to me that Rasputin was brought into religion the way a lot of people are, because there wasn't a lot on him being particularly religious during his upbringing. And I, I don't mean lies. Although, yes, lies. With rituals and the, the general vibe you get when you have a bunch of people all doing the same weird shit, you tend to start feeling like you belong to a community. You, you tend to start saying, okay, this is my community, and we all do the same weird shit, and this is us, and everybody else is the outgroup. And according to a 2015 paper by Rachel Watson Jones and Christine Laguerre of the University of Texas, group rituals are ways to show commitment to your group. They steer the group dynamic, they determine membership. It's all group related functions to make you feel like you belong. And that had to be a big deal to Rasputin. He was made to feel like he didn't belong somewhere in response to the fucking and horse healing and being a bad dad he did. That probably had a big effect on him and his religious inclinations. And while he was there, he made a friend. His friend's name was Macri. And Macri had previously served as an advisor to Tsar Nicholas and his wife Alexandra on spiritual matters, which gave Rasputin a way to be able to get in and advise them, given the fact that, you know, the Virgin Mother had told him to. And getting him in there wasn't too hard, since the royal court of Russia at the time was pretty into the black magic and mad science of the day kind of thing. And when Rasputin got in there, he did some Rasputin stuff. He started off with some horse healing, except that the horse was Alexis, the son of the Tsar. And Alexis had some disorder that people just couldn't figure out. And then Rasputin showed up and did magic, and Alexis got better. Although the evidence seems to point to Alexis being a hemophiliac, a hemophiliac who the doctors probably bled. So odds are it isn't actually so much the hypnotism or the magic or anything, and it's uh, probably got a lot more to do with praying over somebody who doesn't clot being better for them than cutting them. I'm no doctor, but I feel like it's the one time prayer is probably better than medical treatment if you're a hemophiliac in the 1800s. And it was also a little while after this that Rasputin started collecting women with his magic penis. And it might be me editorializing a little bit, but he was known for weird cult fuck stuff, a lot of it, and for healing people with his body. And when you have those two pieces of information, it's hard not to arrive at magic healing penis. Which is what I'm going with. And which didn't sit well with Sar Nicholas, so he had Rasputin kicked out. But Alexis and Alexander really liked having him around, so they had him brought back. There's a couple theories to this. One of them is a combination of Magic Penis and Ra Ra Rasputin being lover of the Russian Queen. But the other one I found makes a little more sense and seems a little more plausible. The other theory is that Rasputin was a morale booster for Alexis, what with being the guy who was around who wasn't, you know, 
cutting him and making him feel worse all the time. And apparently he also made a pretty good political advisor. So when Nicholas was away and Alexandra was calling the shots in his absence, Rasputin was making some pretty, oh, pretty good decisions for her behind the scenes. Although that does step on him being lover of the Russian queen. After he was kicked out and brought back, though, things apparently got darker. His appointees had been filling government positions, he had detractors, and they accused him of all kinds of things, but they disappeared. They apparently disappeared like he was doing demonstrations for a how-to manual for Stalin. So they did what you do to heretical madmen with magic healing powers, super advisor skills, and a wandering magic penis. They brought him over for dinner and then poisoned him, and then shot him because the poison didn't take, and then threw him into a river. And in my favorite rendition, he then walked out of the river, so they shot him again until he quit moving like he was Jason in a Friday the 13th horror porn parody. Actually, on second thought, I'm not sure if Jason is the head of a fuck cult with political aspirations would be a porn parody, or if that is the reboot that the Friday the 13th movies need. But in any case, the, the second shooting almost definitely didn't happen due to the lack of, uh, bullet wounds. And the autopsy causes people to doubt the, that he was poisoned because the uh, autopsy didn't find any poison in his system. But, like, that was 1911 toxicology. I, I couldn't find a lot on 1911 toxicology. And honestly, I'm not sure that it's much better than just screaming t bila trovlen at the corpse. That's probably not very helpful for determining whether or not somebody was poisoned before they were shot. And, I mean, that's that's the, the quick and the short version of, you know, the life and death of Rasputin. Quick note before I move on, though. Uh, apparently, all of this didn't count to the members of the modern Russian Orthodox Church. In the early aughts, there was pressure to canonize Rasputin and Ivan the Terrible. Uh, Ivan was canonized, Rasputin wasn't, and it doesn't really do anything for the information here, but the fact that he was almost canonized by the Russian Orthodox Church is not information that I want to have and not pass it on to you. So now is the Klisti, and the reason why the Klisti are important is because to understand Rasputin better, we need to understand what he believed, and it is, uh, it is heavily indicated in records that he was a member of the Klisti sect. Then the first thing to know about them is that it's really fucking hard to find anything. Were they Satanists? Were they pacifists? Who founded them? Did they exist? Was Rasputin one, or wasn't he? Is that where he got his magic healing penis? I can only find one academic paper that was in a language I can read that was from this century, and honestly, there wasn't a lot available in languages that I can't read, so I really don't feel like I'm missing too much. And that paper was from 2020. It was printed in the Forum for Anthropology and Culture, and I'm going to be leaning on it pretty heavily. I, I don't generally use academic sources very much. Most of the time, I don't have to. I can find things that I feel accurately represent the academic sources because I want you to be able to access the information if you want to. I want you to be able to go. Is that really what that says? And be able to go check. But, uh... The KGB literally tried to wipe them out of existence, and it was during the crazy, terrifying, if you piss off Stalin, you disappear, your family disappears, you disappear from pictures pre-Photoshop. It was that KGB. So they weren't fucking around about it, and we're left with scant materials. And that brings me to the first source. There is a bit of surrounding information, but for the most part it's printed from KGB notes, dealing with the Clisty and the research of the party during that time. So if the Forum for Anthropology and Culture is to be believed, and uh, I don't see a reason to suspect they shouldn't be, I wrote this working off of KGB notes from that time they tried to take out the Clisty, and let me tell you, it's a fucking boring read. I didn't expect it to be really exciting, but it is dry, and it's also translated. Uh, and I, I suspect that that makes it more dry. I have a funny feeling that if I read this in Russian or well, French philosophers in French or German philosophers in German, they would be a lot more colorful. And so I shall assume for the short book worth of notes that I've read. So in 1645, the Russian Orthodox Church was as powerful as, as it was ever going to be. Uh, they were the big dog and they were swinging some big dog dick. Then this guy shows up on what used to be government territory and issues 12 commandments. And that guy's name? 
The guy's name was God. Or, well, actually it was Daniel, Daniel Filipovich. But you wouldn't know that from how he starts off his Twelve Commandments. One, I am that God who was foretold by the prophets and have come down to earth to save the human race. Seek no other God. Two, there is no other teaching. Seek none. Three, stand upon whereon you are set. And I assume this just means wherever you are, be there. Just be mindful, be present. It's like if God wrote an inspirational Facebook post. Four, drink no strong drink. Five, commit no fleshly sin. And more on that later. Six, do not marry. Let him who is married with his wife live with his wife as with a sister. Give not in marriage and set asunder those are to be given in marriage. 7. Use no foul language. Do not swear words and cursing and do not even pronounce of the devil. Call him the enemy. 8. Do not attend weddings or christenings. Do not frequent gatherings where there is strong liquor. So, anything in Russia. 9. Do not steal. If anyone steals but a single kopeck, in the next world that kopeck will be put on the top of his head, and when it melts from the fire of hell, only then will he receive forgiveness. This actually makes this type of Christianity seem a little more reasonable than other forms in the world. I mean, yeah, you have a coin melting on your head, and that fucking sucks, but when it melts, you get to be forgiven. I, for one, am a big fan of prison abolition and uh, restorative justice, and definitely when it lasts forever... I, I mean, there's the whole thing about, like, you know, as an atheist, when you die, you're dead, and so that's, you know, as much of forever as you get to experience, so blah, blah, blah. But, like, seriously, that shit's forever. Definitely appreciate the fact that you get out, you know, you get forgiveness after you're held accountable, especially if it's just stealing a single kopeck. A single kopeck today is a fraction of a penny. Carrying on. Uh, 10. Keep your faith secret and reveal it to no one, not even your father or mother. And if necessary, you must endure the fire and the knout and the axe, but do not reveal anything about the faith. And a knout was a, uh, it was a whip made of leather tongs with wire wrapped around them that was used in Tsarist Russia for punishing criminals. So not the, the kind of thing that would be much fun to endure along with fires and axes. Uh, 11. Visit one another, be hospitable, love one another, keep the commandments. And 12. Believe the Holy Spirit. And with those commandments, this shit got popular. It is basically going to spend the next 300 years spreading so much that it will spawn different sects that will be gathered under the name folk Protestantism. And that's then, though. And this is an older then. And in the older then, Ivan Timifovi... Timofevich Suslov was named Daniel's son, which made Ivan Christ, because that's how that works. And Christ, he did. He got 12 apostles, he taught them stuff, and he sent them out into the world. And it was all very cool and stuff, and then he went, wow, I'm so popular and cool, I'm moving to Moscow. So he did. And he, he built a house called the House of Zion, or the New Jerusalem, depending on who you ask. And that became a point of pilgrimage. But the thing about having your house be a point of pilgrimage is that that is a terrible way to keep a secret. And the super powerful Orthodox churches don't really like when you call yourself Jesus and strut around being on God and stuff. So he got arrested. After he got out, though, because retributive justice just doesn't fucking work, he went hard for the preaching and built four more houses and then died in 1716. And it was at this point that the game changed. Prokopi Lupkin proclaimed himself the next Christ, called his wife Akulina Ivan Ivanovna the mother of God, which should raise questions, but you know what? The Bible is so fucking full of incest and crap that why the fuck not? And this, uh, this shit set a new standard for Christ and his mom to run about doing stuff. In the meantime, the Clisty kept getting more popular, and when people would meet Lupkin, they would call him Sar and cross themselves and then kiss his hands. And again, this is not something that makes the church happy, so they went ahead and arrested 70 people. Uh, they beheaded the nun Anastasia, no relation, and the priest Tikon and Filaret and exiled everyone else to monasteries. This didn't really have the 
effect they were hoping for, and the rest of the Callisti went about spreading the good word, because what is a martyr if not a cult leader persevering? Then in 1745, uh, 416 more people were arrested and exiled to Siberia and monasteries. In the early 1800s, during the reign of Alexander I, it kept gaining influence because he was pretty down with the magic stuff. Mad science hadn't been invented yet, though, so he was only doing the black magic half of things. This also helped it become rooted in high-class social circles and spread to the south down to the Caucasus region. It was about this time also that supposedly Vasily Radier uh, combined G the Jesus prayer with sexual excesses and became the prominent theologian for the Clist. But our footnotes note that this is probably just a load of made-up dookie poops. KGB's words, not mine. There were also a couple spin-off groups at this time, the Shallow Putztvo and the Trezveniki, who kept sobriety as a central tenet. The Trezveniki also recognized marriage and family. Then the interesting information skips a while and picks up around the war communism of 1918, which you may have noticed is after Rasputin died. Apparently, they were largely made up of rich peasants at that time, the Klisti were. Uh, the paper saying, quote, most members of the sect were well-off peasants and traders, i.e. petty bourgeois, end quote. And this caused them to reject the implementation of war communism of 1918 that brought the nationalizing of industry and the sanctions against traders. Andrei Igorovich Malkin, a leader in a branch of the sect, took part in the socialist revolutionary uprising against the Soviets, and in 1919 it was declared by a prophet that this year will, there will be a coup and the Soviet regime will be destroyed. But apparently that happened a lot. Uh, and then when the Soviets implemented the new economic policy in 1921, things softened for a bit and then got bad again. Uh, they gave the KGB a run for their money in their 40s and then disappeared in the 70s and the USSR broke up in the 90s. And that's the history of the Callisti that I have found so far, but I'm still feeling hungry for this, so I will be coming back for more. This does seem like a good moment to ask the question, how does this fit with the Rasputin mythos? And that's a good question. And I had a different view of that question after reading an article from the Gazette, uh, the Montreal one, not the one you're thinking of, from 2000 with Edvard Radzinski. Actually, you know what? It, it could be the Montreal one. If you're thinking of the Montreal one, like, hello, how are you doing, Canada? I don't, I don't, I don't want to discriminate. Like, there's, you know, Montreal is fine, I'm sure. I've never been. Literally, all I know about Montreal is it's where the Montreal screw job happened, and I heard about that from people who hated it. Kind of like Radzinski points out that most of the information we have on Rasputin was gathered from people who hated him. That was terrible, and I should feel bad, but I'm going to leave it in. Um, way to bring it back on topic. Uh, anyway, according to an 814-page file that is supposedly about Rasputin, but I, I have my doubts. It was bought at an auction during that time when the Russian government would have sold you Putin's left nut if the price was right, that I call the Great Liquidation 7, and according to it, Rasputin really wasn't up to all that. He was a degenerate, and he deserved his nickname of debauched one, but post-conversion his life takes on a very different tone, which makes a lot more sense with the Clisty doctrine as we currently understand it. The Clisty at the time believed that you come closer to God through repentance, which doesn't seem so at odds with the commandments. And there is an anecdote about Rasputin getting a prostitute, buying her some beer, not drinking any himself, and then telling her to take off her clothes, looking at her, and then leaving. If he was tempting himself, it makes a lot more sense with the puritanical cultish view that the Clisty had, but it's also in line with the stories we know about him, which probably were drawn largely from people who hated him, but not all from people who hated him, and, and people who did hate him. They probably would have been basing things on, like, enough truth to make it verifiable, right? Either that, or they were remembering things in an unflattering light. That's the kind of vibe you get from the article, but, like, I couldn't find anything uh, from Alexandria? I, I Did nobody ask the Empress what he was up to? It, it seems like that would have come up. What she said would have had weight, even if everyone thought she was lying. It, it should have been around, right? And the last piece of information I have right now, and I haven't read this book yet, um, apparently he looked at the Clisty and ultimately decided against joining them, and that's according to his daughter. 
And that's the kind of thing that people do and can end up being influenced by them. So it, it is possible that his personal brand of Christianity, the one that he actually donned the monk's robes for, were influenced by debauchery and callisty and political intrigue and black magic and maybe mad science. And if that's the case, then his Rasputin's foe may have survived him because it would have been a unique entity. And he may have probably taught somebody. In which case, I'm definitely going to keep looking. And at this point, it's, it also seems like a pretty dubious claim that Rasputin was the lover of the Russian queen. Which, I'm not bummed by that. I mean, you're bummed by that. You're the one that likes court intrigue and scandalous royal affairs. and That's you. You, you, you said that. I'm the high apostate. I don't say those things. But my email is poweredbyapostasy at gmail.com, and the Patreon is uh, patreon.com slash apostates playground. My Twitter is the letter X, Essential Panda, and the show's Twitter, which is really just when updates get posted, is at apostasy powered. And since I mentioned it earlier, my hiking pictures are at ko-fi.com slash outsidey parts, which is ko ficom slash outside y parts. And I will see you next time. I have to sit with this not, definitely not disappointment that there wasn't more intrigue. But I'll, I'll keep looking. I'll find the intrigue. I'll find the intrigue and I'll bring it to you. I'll bring it to you next time. Next time you listen. And I talk about this. Until then, be well. And fuck a Russian queen if you get the chance. Do it for all of us.